Hello everyone, this is Eva Nordic smith with Yoga U Online and I'm very pleased to be here today with Dr. Lauren Fishman and Ellen Salzenstahl who joined us to talk about osteoarthritis. We will talk about what impacts the development of osteoarthritis and whether yoga might help prevent arthritis or even slow its progression. Many of you will already be familiar with Dr. Fishman and Ellen Salzenstahl from their highly acclaimed books on yoga for arthritis and yoga for osteoporosis. Dr. Fishman is an MD and a yoga teacher, and he's known for his innovative and highly successful use of yoga in his medical practice. His work with therapeutic yoga has been featured in numerous national publications, including the Huffington Post, and he has been profiled by Jane Brody in the New York Times as, quote unquote, the yoga doctor. Ellen Saltonstall is an author and a yoga therapy teacher with a master's degree in therapeutic movement education. Ellen is a highly accomplished both teacher and therapist using yoga, and she's particularly known for her great yoga teaching skills and ability to make yoga accessible and available to all people of any age. She is the co-author with Lauren of several books and has a couple of new books out on her own, one on yoga anatomy and one on her method of mind-body ball work that is soon to come out. Lauren and Ellen, warm welcome to both of you. Thank you, glad to be here. So one, one of the big issues we're facing as a nation today is like a virtual epidemic of chronic pain. And a leading source of that pain, I believe, is osteoarthritis with more than 30 million people in the U.S. alone affected by arthritis. Is that correct? That's about right. So, um, Lauren, you must see this in your practice all the time. Every day. I see every it day. almost every day of my life. Uh, from the Medicare patients. Uh, Ellen, you want to say something at this I point? see it every day, too. <laughs> okay. Right, so, so 50 and up, 60 and up, 65 and up? Often 65 and up, but sometimes as low as 30. I mean, there are many kinds mm -hmm. of arthritis, as you probably right. know. There's uh, ankylosing spondylitis, there's gouty arthritis, there's, of course, rheumatoid arthritis, and many mm -hmm. other arthritis. I saw a little girl of 15 who has what's called HLA-B27 positive. It's a genetic abnormality. And she, at age 15, she's almost ready for a hip replacement. Oh, 15, so, you know, wow. Her parents yeah. brought her from far away because they don't want her to have a hip replacement. The, the life of a hip replacement is about 20 years, they estimate. They don't know because, of course, the latest ones haven't gone 20 years. Right, but they yeah. the older ones. And yeah. that would mean she would need four of them, which is impossible. Because right. only are, the thickness of your hip is such that you usually only get two. Right, right. So, so, so she, it, she's it, uh, facing a very tough life unless we can do something. Right. So it's, it's compounded by the fact that we are more athletic. We're doing more running and pounding on the leg. The various you know weird sports have come into vogue, like kite surfing and uh, pogo sticking and uh, then the running is probably the biggest where they run on hard surfaces and then of course people are aging more they're living longer mm -hmm. and uh, arthritis that otherwise would have gone unnoticed becomes pretty serious mm -hmm. so is osteo i mean osteoarthritis used to be known as like the wear and tear disease is that still the way we think about osteoarthritis or is it more involved no, it's got a much more technical diagnosis. It's diagnosed in terms of cartilaginous loss uh, and changes in the bone itself. And the cartilage, they just say loss of cartilage. And that could be in any one of a number of places in the bone. In the knee, there are three bones there and they all have cartilage that kind of encase them. And the cartilage can be lost in one or more of them or just in a special part. Mm. And it, it, it's a characteristic thing. It's not like a traumatic injury. It's not like some genetic abnormality all in itself, so it may be caused by one. And then there are the bones which develop osteophytes uh, and osteos, osteophytes which come up or down like stalagmites and stalactites in, in a cave. Mm 
mm. and they tend to interfere with the function of the joint. The whole so, so, is always the same, loss of range of motion and pain. Yeah. So what causes some people to get arthritis and other people not? And some people get it in the hip, some people get it in the knee. What are the mechanics yeah, what's, that are what's the real cause? Well, there are many factors. I mean, if I were a mathematician, I'd make a differential equation in many variables and would take a, several other mathematicians to solve it. And when they solved it, they would have the results for one person. <laughs> you know, that affect, it can affect one joint rather than another. And you won't be amazed to find that people who walk on crutches don't get arthritis so much in the hip. They get it in the shoulder because that's their weight-bearing joint. Mm -hmm. you, and you see that uh, consistently. You won't be surprised to find that runners get it in the characteristic places. Yeah. Um, so our activities really fun. affect, you know, the activities that we do the most of affect which joints <laughs> are going to wear out the fastest. And everybody has a different way of using the body even in daily life. Sometimes people's mm -hmm. way of just getting up out of a chair is, is damaging without them having any idea of that. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have habits that affect which joints get worn out first. That's and what about one. structural asymmetries? Yeah, and that's only one of the many factors. I mean, there are right. genetic determinants that will make one person's right. hip joints just a little bit less adapted to what we call walking normally. So uh. over 50 years, they experience the kind of stress that others will express and will feel in 150. So there are the genetic factors also that affect the formation of the cartilage at each surface of each joint. You know, the, the right. genetic instructions we inherit at birth are quite specific. If you look at the back of the kneecap, it, it's cut like a gem, just so, because it, it has to interface with two other bones. And it's not a round joint, it's an elliptical joint. So that each infinitesimal change in angle affects the way that, that the knee joint intersects with the other two joints. So the, the kneecap intersects with the femur and the tibia. Yeah. Then there are traumatic events, which don't themselves disrupt the joint, but they cause an inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response eats away at the joint, eats away at the synovial membrane that renews the fluid, eats away at the cartilage, eats away at the bone, and changes mm. the composition of all the you know, biological elements to which the bone is exposed. So that's just so, a couple of the yeah. factors, you know. So you're saying, it used, we used to think about arthritis as wear and tear that wears the cartilage away. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, we end up with pain and mm -hmm. limited mobility. But you seem to be talking uh, about a pathway that's mediated by inflammation. Yeah, I think that's a much more modern definition. Wear and tear, mm -hmm. I mean, if, we, if it really were a case of wear and tear, then uh, the cartilage in your throat, the, the arytenoid cartilage that involves every breath you take in and out would surely be the first to suffer. You know, and the other mm -hmm. joints like, you know, surely it's not just wear and tear. That's a, mm -hmm. it's just a little bit old fashioned and it sort of suggests that as you age, you get arthritis no matter what you do. The way the, yeah. the, 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 uh, the grid on a tire will get thinner and thinner with age. That's wear and tear. The joints, mm -hmm. of course, are replaced in a dynamic way mm -hmm. in healthy people and people with arthritis. Yeah. But nutrition is another factor. That's not wear and tear. That's rebuild and renew, you know, and that has a lot to do with it. If you, I have some patients who unfortunately were in Germany in World War II. Uh, one man, very proud, he says, I'm a bricklayer, and he's very proud of it. And he was there, and I'll just tell you the story. He's got terrible arthritis. And I say, it, it, I, he said, then by the time I was seven, my family was brought to uh, England, and I was in the cafeteria, and I heard something I'd never heard before. A little girl in front of me said, I don't like spinach. He said, I never heard anybody say they didn't like any kind of food. <laughs> this boy was starving as a child. And that lead, led him to a lot of arthritis. Mm, yeah, yeah. So um, Ellen, in, in yoga, we talk a lot about stimulating the synovial fluid uh, when we move the joints. And it's sort of understood or implicit in that statement that that helps keep the joint healthy. So would that have an effect on the inflammation, the potential inflammation of the joint and therefore the degree or the development of arthritis? Uh, is there any kind of underlying scientific truth to our assumption that moving the joints keeps the synovial fluid circulating and keeps the joint more healthy? 
Yes, it's definitely true that when we move the joint, we move the synovial fluid around. And in yoga, we move, you might say, to the extremes of, of the edges of movement. And that's something I want to come back to. How far do we go to the extremes to be safe? But when we do circulate the synovial fluid, it, it is, provides nutrition for the cartilage. So it could slow down that process. But um, if, we, if we move too far to the edges, we can cause inflammation. So then we have you know, that, that medium place, yeah. that fine line of do we do just enough to help the process of healing, but not too much so that inflammation is the result. So what is too much? How would people gauge that? <laughs> it's a hard question. Um, I think common sense and, and <laughs> following the sensations of your body after you do a practice but it's, it's, it, there's, no, there's no hard and fast line saying, oh, you have to do this much degrees and not more. Right. Um, I, think, I think each of us has to be responsible for listening to the body's signals. But is, are those signals pain or are there the other? Can, yeah, pain, but in different degrees. You know, you can have yeah. a little bit of pain. You can have, I mean, there's a whole range of pain from, I right. mean, the classic thing is to measure it from one to 10. But, you know, you, you can be sensitive to your own levels. And, and I know, you know, many yogis, including me, who sometimes decide to work a little harder in the mm -hmm. practice and say, oh, I've been know, there. <laughs> really fun pose. I want to work a little harder. I want to get better at this pose. It's really fun, you know, and, and you can override your own recognition of your pain <laughs> right, <laughs> in that right. process. So that's, that's, the, that's for the mindfulness. And that's our responsibility, really, to, to do a, a safe practice. Right, right. But, you know, you can't make, there's no measurements. You can't say, oh, uh, you know, trikonasana beyond this point is going to be dangerous. That's right. Because right. everybody's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. Well, the truth is we don't know. No one has ever done these studies. I mean, there would be ways of sticking a little periscope into the joint after this much and that much and twice as much activity and yeah. see when the, pro the fluids of inflammation begin to accrue. You could yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, no one's ever done that. But I must say, speaking of the 1 to 10 scale, I'd like to put in a little uh, advertisement for, for us, a, an NIH grant that I just got, in which we're trying to do better than the 1 in 10 scale. And they gave the grant measuring pain. because yoga is a way of alleviating a lot of shoulder pain very quickly. So we can train them, we can judge them and measure them before and after we do the yoga mm. procedure, which relieves the pain 80, 90, even 100%. And it's free. And all they have to do is call my office in New York City and come in and make an appointment. No one is going to charge them. And we are going to relieve them if they happen to have rotator cuff. I just wanted to say it's not our subject today, but it is yoga and it's something. So, all so it's for people with rotator cuff tears. Yeah, only with rotator cuff. That's the other yes. girdle besides and the shoulder girdle, not the hip girdle. Right. And they should, they should email you at, at which email address? Yeah, well, the email address is Lauren, that's uh -huh. my name, L-O-R-E-N, at sciatica.org. All right. Me, and the okay. website is sciatica.org. All right. And they can look me up on the web and my phone number is all over the place and they can call up the office and make an appointment. So uh, just say it's for the rotator cuff yoga study and they'll know what it is and they'll give you an appointment at the right time. Right. But on the subject of the synovial fluid, I think there are important, interesting things to be said. That the, uh, what happens is that almost every other cartilage in the body, in the, in, the, in the ear, in the throat, everywhere else, is covered by a membrane that has blood vessels in it, rich in blood vessels that give forth oxygen and glucose and proteins and hormones and take up the lactic acid and other products of metabolism. But the joints, even though they're cartilage, don't have that, that covering of them, that, that cartilaginous uh, surface of, of a lot of blood vessels. And for good reason. The pressure on the joints would destroy them almost at once. So the synovial fluid carries all those nutrients and all those ways mm. of getting rid of the products of inflammation, which themselves, if they build up, are quite toxic. And the mm. circulation, some uh, orth orthodontists, believe it or not, looking at the TMJ, did the only study I've ever seen, on what happens in, in the, that joint, the fluid in that joint when you chew, when you talk, 
Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's, it's a maelstrom. I mean, there are whirlpools and there are currents and countercurrents. I mean, wow. a great deal happens in every joint. So if you do, as Ellen was uh, describing, you know, absolutely moving the range of motion to, uh, of a joint to its maximum, those, those, that squall, that storm is going everywhere in the joint. And it's got to be mixing things up in a, a perfectly homogeneous and excellent way. Right, right. Cool. So Ellen, are, are there certain types of movement that are particularly beneficial for slowing the progression of arthritis? Well, I always want to have people explore all the ranges of motion of the hip. You know, the hip goes in six different directions. You bring it forward for flexion, you take it behind you for extension, you take it away from the midline for abduction, you go towards the midline for adduction, and then you internally and externally rotate. Those are the six movements. So. Mm -hmm. In a yoga practice, I want people to do all those six movements within a certain range, depending on the type of student I'm working with. You know, are they a beginner? Are they medium? Are they expert or what? So you want to follow all those ranges of motion, and that way you get, you get the most circulation of fluid. And sometimes you have to consider, and in fact, always, you should consider the lower back and the knee and, you know, the neighboring parts, because that's all going to uh, influence how the hip is going to move. So, for instance, you have to stretch their quad muscles, even though only one of them crosses the hip. You just have to stretch them. I mean, that's just one example. Mm -hmm. if, you have to, if you look at yoga, there actually are a lot of poses that do everything except adduct. I mean, there's the eagle. You know, there are a couple that adduct. There are, I guess you could say that Virasana, the hero, adducts and internally rotates mm -hmm. a bit. But that's the one motion that yoga doesn't do very much, and I must say... I love yoga, but it's one of the first signs of, us, of arthritis is that yeah. someone doesn't move their hip, their hip inwardly towards the other, doesn't move their knee really? up towards the other one. So, there, I mean, there's a good reason to think that... You're saying that they can't do it or they... It hurts to do it. They can't do it. They, they oh. hurt. First it hurts, and then after a short time, they absolutely cannot do it. Oh, knee, interesting. I mean, if you consider my arm instead of my leg, their knee gets to the midline, and it doesn't go like that. It just doesn't go any further than that. Oh, the, uh, interesting. It's, it's a very early and a very serious... It's now not, I'm going to go and ch check myself serious. after the <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it is the first place that usually becomes uh, difficult. Interesting. So that range of motion adduction across the midline would be particularly... Yeah important to keep um, yeah and it's related to extra internal rotation also and many people who do <clears throat> yoga think so much about opening the hip so-called opening the hip with external rotation mm -hmm. you know the whole lotus pose right. and wagon you know you want to be able to do lotus pose right but the yeah. internal rotation movements are eb every bit as important to maintain and they're, and they're really you know it's uh, yoga you could I mean, I guess the twists do it to a certain extent. They move your torso towards the hip rather than the hip towards the torso. But I guess Matsyandrasana, Arda Matsyandrasana, does it to a certain extent. But otherwise, right. it, you, it's, it's, not, it's not usually done. You right, just, right. you don't see it in yoga. So uh, yeah. it's time for, for an Iyengar-like person to invent a couple new poses. And it's <laughs> on young, healthy people. Well, we can all do it. Yeah. We, we invent yeah. poses all the time. Well, yes, yeah. it's time for some invention there. So yeah. you seem to be implying that as we lose range of motion, there's less circulation in a particular area of the joint and that would it predisposes to inflammation and- No, no, just the opposite. Uh, it's okay. the joint, it's the core. If you look at the development of arthritis, you know, over time, you have an x-ray of a person at age 40 and then age 50 and 55 and so on. You see that the actual arthritis usually develops at the corners, not in the middle of the joint. I mean, traumatic arthritis is a different animal, but in most gouty arthritis, osteoarthritis, even rheumatoid arthritis, usually it's the corners that get it. And so at least there is suspicion that it's because there is not enough circulation there and the lactic acid and other components of inflammation develop. And in fact, many, I would say, the vast majority of, of doctors at least believe that the real hallmark of arthritis of any kind is inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so if you can avoid inflammation, which mm -hmm. you can do nutritionally and you can do with yoga too, mm -hmm. then you're in much better shape and you're much less likely to have it. So is the key there to keep full range of motion so that there is a healthy circulation? Absolutely. That's yeah. very nicely put. Yes. To go in all the directions, but not too far, because that 
that the corner range, you, you know, yogis can usually push it. Like a friend of mine has severe arthritis now because he's been putting his leg behind his head for, for 20 years and he enjoys it, but you know, he's got some arthritis from that. So we can, we can force the leg into a, into a position that puts too much pressure on the corners. Right. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. If there are <laughs> situations of movements that can be pro- counterproductive. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't mean to kind of put that pose in a category of danger, danger, danger. But right, again, right. each of us has to look at our, our normal range of motion because the actual angle of the hip socket is going to be different for each of us. You know, the, 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 the acetabulum, the socket part might face a little bit more forward for some, a little bit more to the side for some, a little bit higher for some. And that can affect your range of motion in all these fancy yoga poses that we can do. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, maybe some people have the body type that can do putting the leg behind the head or some other extreme range in a different direction. And, but, but not, not many of us do. Right, right. Well, it's just like I have to defend poor little defenseless Viryanjasana, you know. Yeah, I don't, if, if he had arthritis, I'm not sure it's from putting his leg behind his head. I just have to do it. To <laughs> Lauren, doing, I hope that's not the I'm leg not that. A chair. I'm not going to do it for very long. I am seven Are you borrowing a leg? Old. I've been doing it for yeah. I can do it with the other leg, uh, uh, not quite as well. But it's it's uh, it's something that I just want to say. Uh, it's it's that's one factor in many. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's like saying uh, I walked outside and it started to rain, so I'm going to stay in tomorrow, so it'll be a nice day. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of many many factors, and I don't think you should blame the poor pose for that. Well, I said that, I mean, and I mean that. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. just that, you know, extremes can be overdone. Yes, right, I think, right. you know, yeah. that you, you want to push the envelope, but you don't want to shove the envelope. You want or to tear yeah. the envelope. Yeah. You don't want to yeah. tear it. You know, yeah. it's, the yogi, there are many yogis who, are, who really are masochists and are doing it because of the great joy they feel in giving themselves pain. I see them all the time. Really? And they're self-abnegating, and that is not from humility. It's from hedonism. They like it. And it's oh. the same way with put, torturing themselves physically. Right. And one has to be careful. One has to develop a sense, as well as my teacher, Mr. Iyengar, says, your body is your temple. Don't desecrate it. Right, right. Yeah, really. Yeah, and when we talk about the different factors that impact the risk of arthritis, that we talked about limited range of motion in the joints. Another factor, I think, can be structural asymmetries. Like, for example, um, I had a sprained yeah. ankle when I was... 12 Absolutely. years old yeah. that caused a uh, crooked leg and now causing a weird thing going on in my knee, which I think is from the forces not being distributed evenly through the joint. Yeah, yeah. because when we have one injury, we adapt the way we do all our daily movements, and then that changes mm-hmm. everything. It changes everything is all the way up the body, but the hip is, is a big transition point between our standing, our walking, and the rest of the body. So it, it really mm-hmm. absorbs a lot of that uh, compensation. Yeah, yeah, it's it's right. got the second greatest range of motion of all the joints. The the, the shoulder has a little more, has considerably right. more. It's yeah. second, but no, I think if you want to think of some structural asymmetry, it would have to be something like a leg length discrepancy. So mm-hmm. for every pair of steps they take, one side they're going down, then they're going down right. on the head. So it's a constant bump. You know what about eight, the pelvic? You know the pelvic uh, torque that mm-hmm. most people have. Yes, that's another factor, sacroiliac joint derangement, polio, stroke, um, that sort of thing, a a, a club of foot on one side. You know, it has to be something pretty serious. Yeah. I mean, think of it, your joints uh, last 100 years. You know, a a little something isn't going to do it. They're very, not only are they very well put together, but they also replenish and and repair themselves. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. I'm also interested in hearing both of your opinions on this uh, new approach to regenerative medicine that uses stem cell inject- injections as an alternative to hip Well, I do, uh, it. I, I do it in my office. All, I do it every day practically now. Um, uh, there are really four kinds available now. Mm-hmm. One is you, the, the, the mildest and, and one that really works well is to take your own blood, you draw your own blood, or someone draws it, quite Mm -hmm. a bit, 60 cc's worse, it's not nothing. It's not as much as when you give blood, but it's a lot of blood. And you spit it down in a centrifuge, and you, you, out of the 60 cc's, you get two cc's of platelets, so it's quite concentrated. And then you inject that 
And the knee and the hip are probably the best joints in the body, though I, goodness knows I've done it everywhere. And it, it's, I'd say our rate of success is not 100%, but it's about 80%, about wow. four or five. And that's very amazing. Good. Yeah. That's one. Then there are places, there's one in Utah, there's one in Texas, one in New Jersey, where they uh, take the amniotic fluid from healthy uh, cesarean sections, upper middle class women, who then devote their, you know, they dedicate their blood, they give it away, they donate it, and uh, they have to go through rigorous uh, series of filtering and tests so that it's safe. And the U.S. government regulates that. And then... Um, you inject that, and that, like the platelets, they do the same thing. They stimulate the cells that are already there in your hip or in wherever, and upregulate certain DNA and downregulate other DNA, what they call epigenetics. Mm -hmm. So that the, the platelets themselves, they only live two, three weeks there, but they have had effects to stimulate the other cells and change their genetic mm. uh, primacy, if you will. It's the same genes, but certain, other, certain ones are making proteins, certain others are just lying there dormant. Right. And they, they actually make new cartilage. Mm -hmm. Now, I have read about it many times. I've also had patients where I had to do another MRI on them six weeks later, seven months later, and I can see that there actually is cartilage that was this thick is now this thick. I mean, I've seen it. Wow. Um, anterior yeah. cruciate ligament tears, other kinds of things, but especially arthritic changes are really well taken care of by this. Cool. Now, a word of warning, sometimes the, the uh, radiologists will say, oh, I saw your MRI, you have no cartilage left. N-O cartilage left. But that, of course, you can't tell that. You have to look in there with the microscope to see if there were no cartilage cells left. I've done it on people of whom that is said. And of course, they do have cartilage cells, which are stimulated by this procedure. Right. The third way is they take umbilical cord jelly. It's called mesen mesenchymal or mesenchymal uh, mm -hmm. stem cells. And that seems to work. Uh, it's, it's, it's newer, but it seems to work even better. And they wow. take Wharton's jelly, which is not something you want to put on your toast, comes out of the umbilical cord also. It's the, sort of the ground fluid that's there. Wow. So the wow. umbilical equivalent of fascia, if you will. And then you can inject that too. And that seems to work better than almost anything else. And wow. then there are the actual stem cells that today you usually need to grow them in a way that is illegal in the United States. They do it in Germany. They do it in Panama, where American doctors are good at it. And of course, they do it in Israel and Japan, and uh, probably all over, probably Brazil too. Fascinating. So they work. Fascinating. They work very yeah. well. Yeah. And they are, you know, they, they re relieve the, the cartilaginous loss. What do they do for the bone? Not that much. If your problem is bone, uh, it, it usually won't do it. But you can build up enough cartilage so the bone becomes less of a problem because uh. the joint is again riding on the cartilage. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, so back to some of us, um, something all of us can do before we get to the point where we need uh, stem cell therapy or hip replacements or whatever, which is yoga. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so Ellen, tell us about, you have a course in Yoga U online on uh, arthritis of the hip and how to, the, the various preventive measures you can take using yoga to keep the hip joint healthy. Tell us about the course and what you're covering. Well, we're going to cover some of the uh, medical kind of um, issues that Lauren has been talking about. There'll be some theory and uh, nice diagrams that help explain that. And then we'll go through the various poses that we think are beneficial. And of course, you know, I mean, a big wide ranging yoga, yoga practice is good and we won't be going through every single pose, but we'll go through some representative poses and showing some adapted versions of them so that people who already have some arthritis can still do a good practice. Because what I found in my practice is that people come in and they say, well, I have arthritis, so I stopped doing yoga because I was scared. Mm -hmm. I was afraid I was gonna make it worse. Mm -hmm. So one of our goals is to help people who already have some fear about yoga or some hesitation or some pain, some discomfort, to show that they can still do yoga and that it, that it very well could slow the progression uh, help their pain level significantly and uh, perhaps prevent them having to have surgery, which we would never guarantee, but we could, you know, say that that's a possibility. This, I've seen this, it this so is many worth times. a try, right? Yeah, worth there's, a try, absolutely. There's a little more to say about what yoga does here. Yoga 
I think I say it in one of the earlier webinars we did, yoga done properly in a cool room without eating too much beforehand and done not for 15 minutes where you snap out of one pose into another, but done at least intermittently for a couple of hours. See, it definitely stimulates this molecule that comes out of our, our own muscles called PGC1 alpha. And PGC1 alpha is known as a potent anti-inflammatory. Hmm. It reduces cancer, it reduces Alzheimer's disease, diabetes type two, and it's very good for arthritis. Now, recently I did some more reading and I learned that PGC1 alpha is the cardinal stimulant of increased mitochondria. Now, the mitochondria are present, they're very interesting things in themselves. I'm not, don't get me started. I mean, they're, they were bacteria that somehow got into the cell, and now they're, they're endosymbiotic. The cell can't live without them, and they can't live without the nucleus and the rest of the cell, they, even though they have their own DNA. And that's how you, it's only the mother's DNA that goes into the mitochondria. Yeah. And uh, even though you, uh, the, the, many of their proteins nevertheless come from the nucleus, the, the DNA in the nucleus making the protein and vice versa. And the, no cell, no cell of a multicellular animal, everything but amoeba and bacteria ha have mitochondria. And if they didn't, they would die immediately because the, all the energy in the cell mm -hmm. to do anything, you know, yeah. secrete a hormone, contract a muscle, uh -huh conduct a nerve impulse, whatever the cell does, um, comes from the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And the biggest stimulus for the mitochondria is PGC1 alpha. Interesting. Now that applies to cartilaginous cells. If you have the PGC1 alpha, they get more mitochondria, they're more energetic, and they're more able to do what, what they do, which is protect the cartilage that's there and make new Interesting. stuff. Interesting. Same for the bone. Yeah, wonderful. Isn't Great. that wonderful? It's very exciting, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go check my uh, hip adduction here. <laughs> yeah. so, so that would go. I mean, you would develop more of PGC1 alpha, even if right you, then and there. I mean, you don't have things with the hip. Right. You know, it, it suffuses through your entire system. Right. So right. it's good for all the joints. All yeah. the joints, and no matter which joint you're moving. Excellent. Great. Exciting. Well, thank you so much, Lauren and Ellen, for, for joining us and You're thanks welcome. for ordering the, uh, offering this uh, super important uh, course. And we're very much looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Eva. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.